My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm in Jerusalem, and I'm in an area that was once the Tower of Antonia, a huge fortress built by Herod the Great and named in honor of his friend Mark Antony, who was the lover of Cleopatra. That's amazing to me how all of these events are so connected. But Jesus was brought here to this very area because this is where Pilate's palace was, and this is where Jesus was judged. And the Bible tells us about it in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 2. It says, And when they had bound him, now listen to these words, they're very important. When they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. They brought him to Pilate's palace, and Pilate judged him. But what I want you to see in this verse, it says, They led him. That's amazing. They really didn't have the power to arrest Jesus. They really didn't have the authority or the power to even lead him. Jesus could have called upon 12 legions of angels. He had already demonstrated power to knock soldiers flat. So much power was operating him even in the moment of his arrest that he healed Malchus, the servant of the high priest. Everywhere you look in this story, there is power or the availability of power to deliver him. But yet the Bible says they led him. How do you lead someone with all that power? Well, the word lead is the Greek word ago, the same word which was used to describe wrapping a rope around the neck of a lamb and leading a lamb. They led Jesus, just like Isaiah 53, 7 says, as a sheep to his slaughter. Jesus knew it was the will of God for him to die on the cross. That's why he did not use his power to resist he did not call on 12 legions of angels. Jesus could have stopped the whole thing, but Jesus knew what was the Father's plan. And when they wrapped the rope around his neck, think really how silly that is, that he could be restrained by a rope. Jesus simply yielded and allowed them to lead him as a sheep to slaughter because Jesus knew this was the will of God that he die for the sins of the human race. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. I'm so glad you've joined me for today's program. We're going to jump right into our series on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So far, we've spent all of these programs in the Garden of Gethsemane, specifically in the Apostles' Grotto, which is the cave where Jesus was betrayed by Judas Iscariot. And we've seen that in that cave, tremendous power was demonstrated. Jesus spoke the words, I am, and when he did, power was detonated. The power of the Spirit was released so strong that the Bible tells us a whole cohort of soldiers, that's 600 soldiers plus temple police, wobbled backward until finally they fell hard on the ground under the power of God. In that moment, Peter grabbed a sword and cut the ear off of Malchus, who was the public spokesman of the high priest. So Jesus then demonstrated power to heal Malchus. Then as they're taking Jesus away, a naked boy comes running into the midst of them carrying a linen cloth. And as we saw in the last program, this was a boy that was accidentally raised from the dead. We read about this in Mark chapter 14. When Jesus spoke those words, I am, and supernatural power was released that knocked all the soldiers onto their back, the same power accidentally, peripherally, touched a boy that had just recently been buried and raised him from the dead, and he came crawling out of his grave and came into the midst of this big happening in the Garden of Gethsemane. Such power was being demonstrated there in the Garden of Gethsemane, plus Jesus said that if he had exercised his option, he could have called upon 12 legions of angels, which he did not do. Instead, Jesus surrendered. They wrapped a rope around his neck, and they led him from the Garden of Gethsemane over into the city of Jerusalem. And this is where we're going to begin today's program. But I'm speaking to you from my series called Unknown Facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Maybe they're not unknown to everyone, but they were unknown to me. I had heard the same Easter message year after year. 
and I decided to search for something new and begin to study deeply Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and was amazed at what I found. The scriptures just opened to me, and I saw things in the scriptures that no one had ever shared with me, and that's why I call this series Unknown Facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's 25 parts based on these programs. It comes with a wonderful study guide with all the Greek words, the definitions, the points, the principles, questions for you to consider. It's really perfect for your personal study. It will help you grow. Or if you're discipling someone, and I hope that you are, or if you have a Bible study group, I can't imagine anything for your group that would be better to prepare them for Easter. We're also offering you my book called Paid in Full, an in-depth look at the defining moments of Christ's passion. And today we're going to begin this message by reading to you from this book. I want to begin with a story about an event when I really felt like somebody spit in my face. Have you ever felt like someone spit in your face? Well, listen to this as I share an event from my life. Reading from page 110. Some years ago, I visited another church to hear a special speaker who had come from afar. That evening at the meeting, that local church that I was visiting announced they would be starting a building program. As I sat there, God's Spirit spoke to my heart and instructed me to sow a sacrificial seed into their building program. It was a time when we desperately needed money for our own building program. So anything I sowed would be a sacrifice. But the amount the Lord put in my heart was significantly beyond what my natural mind would have ever possibly conceived. I'll never forget that night sitting there, hearing the Lord tell me to sow a certain amount, and I was stunned because the amount was so substantial. What made it even harder was for me to give this gift to this particular church, because this particular church where I was, to whom the Lord was telling me to give the gift, had acted maliciously toward our church in the recent past. They had lied about us, scoffed at us, and even prayed for our downfall. And now the Lord was telling me to sow a large gift into that same church. Throughout that entire service, I argued with the Lord. The issue really wasn't the money, although we could have used the money ourselves at that moment. The issue I was wrestling with was giving a gift of this size to this church that had treated us with contempt for so long. Finally, the Spirit of God asked me, are you willing to sow a seed for peace with this other church? You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit asks us questions that really confronts us. And the Holy Spirit said, are you willing to sow a seed for peace with other, this other church? And that clenched it. I knew I had to say yes. So I pulled out my checkbook and wrote what I considered to be a sizable gift for this church. And believe me, it was sizable. Writing that check was difficult, but once it was written, my heart was flooded with joy because I knew I'd been obedient. You know what it's like when the Holy Spirit tells you to give a gift, you wrestle with it, but when you finally give it, oh, you have such joy because you were obedient. But one week later, the pastor to whom I gave the gift was at a meeting with his staff and church leaders, and the pastor told his leaders, now listen to this, the pastor told his leaders, look at this puny little check that Rick Renner gave us. Couldn't he have done any better than this? Well, you know, I was really stunned when I heard what he said. It was not puny. By any stretch of the imagination, in any nation of the world, it would have been considered a very sizable, very substantial gift. And it was, and especially for us at that time, it was a very sacrificial gift, and he called it puny and actually made fun of us. When I heard how this pastor viewed the financial gift I'd given, I was shocked. But I was literally stunned by what the pastor did next. He devoted the next part of his staff meeting to discussing all the things he didn't like about our church and about me. He poked fun at us, ridiculed us, mocked us, and put us down in front of his people. Instead of being thankful for the gift that we gave, which was sacrificial, he once again demonstrated utter disrespect and contempt for us. And when I heard about this event... It hurt so badly that it cut deep into my heart. How could anyone say that gift was puny? 
It would be considered significant in any nation of the world. But what hurt the most was that the pastor had put us down and publicly made fun of us in front of his staff and his leadership. And of course, I heard about it because people always make sure that you hear about that kind of a thing. And I remember feeling as if I had been spit on. I think nearly everyone has felt taken advantage of and spit on at some point or another. But imagine how Jesus must have felt the night he was taken to Caiaphas, the high priest, where he was literally spit on. He was literally spit on. And that's where we're going to begin today. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 67 and 68. Listen to what the Bible says about that event. It says, Then did they spit in his face, and buffeted him, and smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Now think about it. Jesus had ministered among them for three years. He had healed the sick. He had taught the scriptures. Jesus even had a philanthropic part of his ministry which provided food for the poor. Jesus did so many good things for three years. He had done good, done good, done good. Acts chapter 10 verse 38 says he was anointed by the Holy Spirit who went about doing good. That's all he had done was do good. And now he was sitting in the midst of religious leaders who were literally spitting in his face. And Matthew Chapter 26, verse 67 says, Then did they spit in his face. How many people spit in his face? It says, Then did they. That word they refers to all the religious leaders that were assembled that night with Caiaphas. And most scholars agree there were probably about a hundred men there that night. And the Bible says they spit. The word spit is a Greek word which means to spit. But listen to this. To spit in someone's face was the strongest act one could take to show utter disrespect, repugnance, dislike, or hatred. To spatter spit on a person's face was intended to humiliate, demean, debase, and shame that person. To make it even worse, the offender would usually spit hard and close to the person's face, making it all the more humiliating. In that culture, and in that time, if you wanted to really show your total repugnance, your total disgust for someone, then you would gather as much saliva as you could in your face, in your mouth, then you'd get right up in their face and spit hard in their face. This was the strongest act they did at that time to show repugnance, total disgust for someone else. And that night Jesus was sitting in the palace of Caiaphas, with about a hundred religious leaders, and then did they, they spit in his face. One by one, they came in front of Jesus, taking turns, taking their time, spitting hard in his face. And by the time that they were finished, Jesus' face was literally dribbling. It was oozing with the spit that had been spattered all over his face by religious men dressed in their religious garb, religious clothing. Outwardly they looked so dignified, but inwardly they were so rotten and they hated Jesus. They despised Jesus for several reasons, which I'll cover in just for a moment. And to express their total disgust of him, one by one, about a hundred of them lined up and they took turns spitting as much spit as they could right into the face of Jesus. And by the time they were finished, his face was covered with spit. It was in his hair. It was in his beard. It was dribbling down upon his clothes. It is amazing what they did to Jesus. And that's not all. Because verse 67 tells us, then did they buffet him. Wow. The word buffet is a Greek word, kolophizo. It's a well-known Greek word. This word buffet, the Greek word kolophizo, means to strike with the fist. It usually pictures a person who is violently beaten. If it wasn't insulting enough to spit on Jesus, and just remember, 100 of them have lined up one at a time, each of them taking turns, gathering as much saliva as they can in their mouth, and one by one, now they're spitting hard. Can you just imagine the impact of that spit in the face? 
100 of them spitting in his face. Then they get in line again, and now one by one, they come to Jesus, and each one of them, they, the Bible says, begin to buffet him, or they double up their fist, and one by one, they begin striking him as hard as they can in the face. This was not only brutal, it was sadistic. This was sick. This was demonic. They wouldn't be satisfied until they had insulted Jesus and physically abused him. And that's not all. The Bible goes on to say, Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. This word smote, the Greek word rapidzo, means to strike with the palms of the hands or to slap. So now they have spit in his face. Jesus is covered with their dribble. Now they've doubled up their fists. One by one, they have hit him in the head. And now others line up who decide to slap him in the face. Slap him. Well, you know what it feels like to be slapped. And one by one, now they're slapping him. So they've spit on him. They've hit him with their fist. Now they're slapping him. And then they begin to play games with him. The Bible says they blindfolded him and said, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? I want you to understand, they hated Jesus. Most of them were Sadducees. And Sadducees didn't like anything miraculous. They didn't believe in the supernatural. They believed all the stories of the Old Testament were just myth and legends, superstition. They tried to talk it all away. And here was Jesus who represented everything they didn't believe in, everything they didn't like. Jesus had a miraculous ministry. And when they spit on Jesus, they were spitting on the anointing. When they hit Jesus, they were striking the anointing. When they slapped Jesus, they were slapping the anointing. This was an attack against the anointing of God, which they despised, that operated in Jesus. And Jesus sat there and took all of the abuse. It's amazing. John 1.11 says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. These were His own people. And notice how they treated Him. And the Bible goes on to say they blindfolded Him. They blindfolded him. The Greek word which means they literally put a wrapping around his face so that he couldn't see what was happening to him or what was happening around him. And then as they slapped him, they said, Now prophesy to us, thou Christ. Tell us who was it that slapped you. If you're really a prophet, if you really have such gifts operating in you, you can't see anything. So just tell us prophetically, who is it that's slapping you now? And they slapped him and they struck him and they spit on him. That is just amazing to me. But that is what happened to Jesus when he was with Caiaphas that night. Now, what is totally amazing to me, stay with me, it is likely that in the midst of all those people spitting on him, striking him, slapping him, and playing games with him, it's likely that among all of them was Malchus. Malchus. Malchus, whom he had just healed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Why would Malchus be there? Because he was the assistant of the high priest Caiaphas. If Caiaphas was there, you can be sure that Malchus was there. Malchus is the one we believe who had overseen the arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. So he would have come with Jesus from the Garden of Gethsemane over into the city of Jerusalem, and he would have been present in this event that night. And it's likely that Malchus got caught up in what was taking place and also spit in Jesus' face and struck Jesus and slapped Jesus and taunted Jesus when he had an ear that had just been miraculously restored by the power of Jesus Christ. After all that Jesus had done for Malchus, did Malchus spit on Jesus? It's possible. I don't know if you ever felt that someone spit on you. But it's terrible when you feel that someone has taken advantage of you, or after you've done something kind for someone, they didn't appreciate it. Maybe they even ridiculed it. That's what I felt when I gave that check to that other church. 
And then they made fun of me and called it a puny check. It was such a sacrificial thing for me to do at that time when we really needed a lot of money for our own building program. That's why I wrestled with the giving of it that night. It was a big thing for me to do and to give it to that church, that church that had scoffed us, that church that had shown contempt for us. And now the Spirit of God was saying to me, are you willing to sow a seed for peace with that church? Well, I had to say yes to that question. So I pulled out my checkbook, wrote that check, gave it by faith, sowed a seed for peace. My heart was so free. I was so glad I had sown that gift. And then I received word about what that pastor said about the gift and about me and about our church to his staff and to his leaders. And it was like a dagger was injected into my heart. It hurt me so deeply. I really felt spit on. You know, in life it just happens. Sometimes you're not appreciated. And rather than be hurt, rather than become offended, which is what the devil wants to happen, rather than become bitter, you have to go to the cross and give it to Jesus. And the good news is Jesus understands what it's like to be spit on because Jesus was really spit on. It wasn't figurative for Jesus. 100 religious leaders. Can you imagine if the people of Israel had been allowed to peek into the room that night and they had seen their dignified religious leaders that they saw in church, they saw in synagogue, they saw at the temple all the time, dignified, carrying on so spiritual, but behind closed doors, gathering as much saliva as they could in their mouths to spit hard into the face of the Son of God, spitting against the anointing, then doubling up their fists, striking Jesus, striking the anointing, then slapping Him, slapping the anointing, then blindfolding Him and playing games with Him. Tell us, Christ, who is it that slapped you? If you're really a prophet, exercise your prophetic skills and tell us who's slapping you now. You see, for Jesus, it just wasn't a figure of speech. Jesus was really spit on. So if you feel like you've been offended or abused or someone's treated you with contempt, you tried to do something good and you feel like they spit on you, you can talk to Jesus about it because Jesus really knows what it means to be spit on. He came unto his own. These were his own people. And John 1.11 says, His own received him not. He gave his life for them, and they spit on him. Wow. So I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you're feeling today or what situation you're facing. But whatever it is that you're facing, if you feel abused or you feel a lack of appreciation, go to Jesus because Jesus knows what it means to be spit on. And if anybody understands, it's Jesus. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. From the courtyard of Pilate to the hill of Calvary, every step Jesus took on that Good Friday, he had you in mind. The Bible says Jesus died so our debt could be paid in full. In his book, Paid in Full, Rick Renner guides you through the details of Jesus' final hours on earth. In Paid in Full, you'll discover that this striking narrative of love and redemption is much more than the story taught in Sunday school. This powerful book can be yours for just $15. When you call or go online today, you can also get unknown facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $40, you can discover the power of the cross and the plan to forgive mankind of sin like never before. Don't miss this special offer, paid in full, and unknown facts about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Call now or go to renner.org. My name is Joe Renner coming to you from Moscow, Russia, and I want to tell you how your support is impacting thousands of people right here in Moscow. All around the world, people are living longer, and many elderly people in Moscow are left helpless and lonely. 
Loneliness is a terrible thing. No one should be left to die in loneliness. But because of your financial support, we're able to reach these wonderful people. And because of the gifts of our partners, we're able to give these precious people new life and a sense of community. Each week, we hold a concert for this great generation. After the concert, we invite these people to stay for a Bible study where they hear about Christ. Through these events, thousands of people have accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior in the sunset years of their lives. Now, not only are they finding community, overcoming their loneliness, but they're finding hope. They're finding Jesus. It's only because of generous people like you who give that we're able to reach these people for Jesus. Would you consider joining us as a partner today? With your support, we're able to reach even more of these precious people. No one should die lonely. More importantly, no one should die without the opportunity to know Jesus. With your support, we're able to reach these people. Please call or go online right now before it's too late for one of these special people. Right from your home, you can help us help others by becoming a partner and a part of the solution. Please call us or go online to winner.org. Your generous support makes a difference. Please call or go online right now. Before I close today, I want to thank you for communicating with me and letting me know that these teachings have been a blessing to you. And I want to tell you that if you need prayer, we're here for you. We are people who believe in prayer. Denise and I, our entire team, we are people of prayer. And when we say we'll pray for you, we really mean we'll pray for you. If you'll contact us, let us know what the need is that you're facing in your life right now. It would be our privilege to go to the throne of grace and to pray with you. But I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series called Unknown Facts About the Death, Burial, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ. This series is designed to make you look at the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus in a way that you've never looked at it before. It comes with a marvelous study guide that you will enjoy so much. The back of the series says, a revolutionary look at the story you thought you knew. The events of Christ's last days, from Gethsemane to Golgotha and to the resurrection, this series will enable you to see more than you've ever seen before in the world's greatest story. Order your copy today. We're also offering you my book called Paid in Full, an in-depth look at the defining moments of Christ's passion. But I want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus today, I pray for every person that has felt abused or spit on by somebody else. Lord, I know that you understand and I pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the healing power of God to heal the heart. I thank you, dear Father, that you come with your power to comfort us and to enable us to face whatever it is that's in front of us today. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Well, I thank you for being with me today. Remember, Ecclesiastes 8.4, it says, Where the word of a king is, there's power. Let God's Word release its power in your life today. And I'll see you in the next program. Thank you for watching this broadcast. For more information on product resources or to learn how you can partner with this ministry, please connect with us at renner.org. Also, please be sure to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.